my name is John Hennessy. Welcome to my first vlog video. Why why is John Hennessy doing a vlog video? Uh, it's because my kids have been bugging me for a long time and telling me that people have lots of questions and they want to get to know more about me and our business. And I kind of thought, well, we kind of already do that through social media, our website, our YouTube videos. And they all felt, and we have, we have five kids, uh, ages from 17 through 23, plus a future son-in-law. Uh, anyway, all six of them have been bugging me, so I've finally given in. So here's our, our first vlog. We may try to do this on a weekly basis, depending on my travel schedule. Anyway, so I said, I don't, I don't know when I really have time for that. And I, I thought, well, I can, I can throw a GoPro in the windshield of the car and, and do it while I'm driving to the office, which takes about 30, 35 minutes. So uh, I'll try to make it uh, more concise than that. Uh, so anyway, uh, my oldest daughter, Emma, put, some, put up uh, something on social media last night uh, asking for questions for John Hennessy. So I think one of the first questions was, when and how did the business Hennessy Performance start? And in 1991, uh, I had a small construction business where we did uh, environmental cleanup, primarily asbestos abatement. So the building had had an environmental issue. We would go in and remediate that. And and so uh, since I wasn't married, didn't have kids, uh, made a pretty decent living at that. And had always been a car guy modifying car. I was, bought my first car when I was 15. Uh, I was a 69 old 442 convertible and I think the first thing I did to it is pop the hood and took the top of the air intake, the air filter system on top of the quarter jet, as we used to call it, quarter dog, car four girl carburetor and I flipped the lid upside down so a little more air could go into the air filter and I've been modifying cars ever since but not as a business so in 91 I had been reading in different car magazines back in the day, Motor Trend, Hot Rod, there used to be a magazine called Turbo Magazine, about different guys that were modifying cars, and they are going to different races, and one of the races that really stood out to me was the Pikes Peak Hill Climb in, in Colorado. And I love Colorado, I love the mountains, and I read this story about this guy named C. Van Toon. Van ended up going on to becoming the the editor-in-chief at Motor Trend Magazine back in the late eight, late 90s, early 2000s. But anyway, I'm just reading about this guy that goes out and buys an all-wheel drive Eagle Talon 2-liter, I don't know, 195 horsepower, and he puts a roll cage in it, and he goes to Pikes Peak, and he races at Pikes Peak. And I thought, wow, that just seems like an average you know, car guy like me, and he just went and got a cool car. And this is back when Pikes Peak was all dirt, which I think was part of the appeal. It's kind of a big, you know, kind of the ultimate rally. I'm like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. I mean, my name's not not Foyd or Unser. I can't just get a car and show up at the Indy 500, but I mean, if an average guy can go race up Pikes Peak, maybe I can too. So I think that was the probably the one of the things that kind of planted to see the idea of, hey, I want to go do some racing. Got a little bit of money, and uh, I've got the time to do it and the desire to do it. So the question became, okay, what car am I going to get to race up Pikes Peak? So again, this is 1991. This is when there were kind of a, a group of some pretty cool Japanese cars that hit the market. There was the 300CX twin turbo Nissan, which was a great car back in the day. Um, the Mark IV Super had not come out yet, but the Mark III was still out and guys were modifying those. And then I read about another new car that was getting some pretty good accolades in the car magazines that was made by Mitsubishi and it was called the 3000 GT. BR4, and that particular model in 91 had 300 horsepower, it was all-wheel drive, four-wheel steer, it had an active aero where the, the front air dam would lower down to give it better aerodynamics, and the wing would tip forward for a little more downforce, and back in that time frame, kind of my dream car was the Porsche 959. I've always loved all-wheel drive and German cars and high technology, and in my opinion, at that point in time, the 959 was probably the most advanced, I won't even say sports car, the most advanced exotic car, supercar in the world. But they were, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. You, 
you couldn't buy them in the U.S. or guys like Bill Gates and other rich guys that, that bought them, but they couldn't import them. They'd have to go to Germany or a different country to drive them. So anyway, so, you know, that was kind of my dream car. When I saw the Mitsubishi with a lot of these same features that the 959 had, I thought, okay, that might be a, a good car to, to, to acquire and, and potentially modify for more performance and go race the Pikes Peak. So I went out, found a, found a dealer in Houston that had a car. The, the dealer was actually very nice, a guy named Ramsey Gilman. Uh, made me a deal on the car when he didn't have to make me a deal. He could have sold it to me for full retail price, but he gave me a little bit of a deal, uh, which I appreciate. And so that's kind of where the journey began. I acquired the car, you know, uh, at this point, I probably bought it in March of 91. And Pikes Peak is always right around 4th of July, so I knew I needed to get a roll cage in it uh, and the other requirements that they require for safety for the event. But at the same time, I knew I wanted to get more performance out of it, and I've been reading in the car magazines about a Japanese company by the name of HKS where they had other parts for other cars, but they didn't. nobody had anything for this car. So I kind of searched around and found a couple different mechanics that thought they could modify the exhaust for me or help me put a boost control or make an air intake for it. So we kind of fumbled around with it for about a month and there were no dynos back in these days, uh, but we made the modifications in the butt dyno uh, in the seat of the pants and driving the car. It felt like a different car. It felt like a, a much faster car. So I, I was having a lot of fun with that. I hadn't raced it yet. And then I'd also read about a, a race in Nevada called the Silver State Classic which happens in September of every year, but they had opened up a second race on the same course in Nevada that they ran in May, and that was coming up, and it's called, it was called the Nevada Open Road Challenge. And I think this is the first, first year that they had the Nevada Open Road Challenge, so I hadn't put the cage in the car yet, but I did have the modifications done, so I put five-point harnesses in it and a fire extinguisher and looked at the rules, and. I thought, okay, I'm going to go do the Nevada Open Road Challenge before I go do the, the Pikes Peak race. So anyway, I show up and drive my car out to, to Vegas, and uh, I've got you know spare, a couple spare tires and wheels and luggage and helmet and race suit packed in the back and some tools. And, and so before you did the race, and I'll get to more details about that race, before you do the race, you've got to do what they call qualifying so that you have to go up to the speedway in Vegas. They've got a road course there and they had a really cool guy named Terry Herman who, who died in a race at the Silver State a few years later. But he had raced in Indy, won at Daytona. Uh, cool guy. And basically they just wanted people to get out that were novices like me to get out and have a little bit of experience on the track. And so while we're doing that, I'm out there, I'm having a good time. I'm going around the track. I go a little wide on a turn and uh, when I pulled back onto the, I was, had two tires in the dirt, when I pulled back onto the track, uh, it dinged one of my, I think it dinged my front wheel and it tore the tire. And at that point, so this is on Friday, the race is on Sunday, I'm like, uh-oh, I've got, I had a spare tire, but I didn't have a spare wheel. And so we went down to the discount tire, pulled the wheel off, I brought a mechanic out with me, we figured that the ding in the wheel, we couldn't get a replacement wheel, but we figured that we could take a torch and heat the wheel up and knock the ding out of the wheel. Uh, again, probably not a, looking backwards, not a very good idea, but I wanted to race. So we, we, we fixed the wheel. We had to put a few extra wheel weights on it to get it to balance out, but everything seemed to be fine and dandy. And off from Las Vegas to uh, Ely, Nevada, we go. Ely's about 300 miles north of Vegas, kind of up in the mountains. And then the Silver State race, the Nevada Brewer Road Challenge, runs on a highway called Highway 318 between two little cities in the middle of nowhere. One goes from Lund to Heiko, Nevada. And really the only thing out there are, it's open range, so there might be horses or cattle running around. Uh, a lot of long straightaways and uh, a kind of a, a interesting canyon that you go through called the Narrows. Uh, but anyway, we show up and I'm hanging out and there are other car guys there. and. Back in the day, the kind of the badass cool car at the at the at these races were the Panteras. I'm like, oh man, that's that's such a cool car and sounds ridiculous and probably stupid fast. So anyway, I'm sitting with a couple of other guys that I met at the race and we're sitting at Pizza Hut and we're talking to these these uh, veterans and there's one guy named Phil Henry 
who had done the race and I'd read about him in some of the car magazines back in the day and, and we asked him, we're like, hey, what class should we run and we haven't picked a class yet. And they said, well, you know, based on your car and your experience, you might want to run like in the 140 class. And I thought, well, I think my car, I know my car will go faster than that. I think I can drive faster than that, but you know what? I'll defer to your judgment and we'll just, I entered my car in the 140 mile per hour class. So anyway, Sunday morning comes along. We get out to just ahead, just right before the starting line. And this is a race where you're just running for time. You're not racing against other cars. They let the cars go one at a time. They spaced them apart. They would let each car go with about a 30 to 60 second gap. And the idea is that you get out on the course and if somebody's going slow or somebody's going faster, if you see them coming, you just move over and let them go by. You're not trying to block anybody from racing. So again, I'm in the 140 class and right in front of me is a red Pantera. Sounds mean, the green flag drops down the highway 318 he goes as I'm hearing him pull through the gears. Now it's my turn for the green flag and you know the adrenaline's flowing. Anyway, green flag drops, off I go, five speed, I'm rowing through the gears. I get it up into fifth gear and I'm still accelerating. And this is with my modifications. I guesstimate that we had around 400 horsepower in the car, which is about 100 horsepower bump over stock. And again, I think stock the car ran, one of the magazines ran something in the 160s. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe my car's 10 miles an hour faster. Maybe I'll get a chance to find out on in the race. And so as I get it up into fifth gear, all of a sudden in the back of my mind, I start thinking about, I'm going pretty fast now, I'm going 140, 150. And I start thinking, you know what? I'm running on a, on a wheel that was dented like two days ago. And we took a torch and a hammer and hammered it out and got it to balance. And I'm thinking, I sure hope that tire holds air pressure and we don't have any issues. And I, I, I all of a sudden just got a rule, just kind of in a state of nervousness, where my right foot was started twitching on the gas pedal. And I'm kind of on the gas and off the gas. And I'm like, well, that's no good. I just started the race. I'm going to get my butt kicked. So I thought, what, what? I can't, but I couldn't control it. And I thought, what am I going to do to overcome that? So I took my left foot off the dead pedal and I, I just mashed on top of my right foot so I keep my foot flat to the floor and keep the, keep the engine running at wide open throttle. And about the time I did that, I noticed that the red Pantera that took off a minute ahead of me, I was now closer to him than, than I was before I was trying to figure out the whole twitchy foot program. And I thought, okay, I, I'm, I'm gaining on that guy. That I mean, that's supposed to be one of the fastest cars out here. And here I am, I'm gaining on that guy. Maybe I can catch that guy and pass him. So I think that God kind of gave me that spirit of, of, of competition and wanting to catch catch the Pantera, beat the Pantera, totally took my mind off of uh, the, the front tire and wheel program and and uh, my twitch in my foot went away and now the competitive juices were flowing. And so I thought, okay, well I passed that guy. Well, I see another car up in front of him. Maybe I can catch him. And so I, I don't know how many cars I passed in the race, um, but it was probably 15 or 20 cars. And uh, they have rules now where they don't want you to pass cars because obviously there's a added level of danger when you've got cars passing each other at 150 mile an hour plus on a highway, narrow highway. And so anyway, I started passing cars and the juices are flowing and I'm not really looking at the speedo, but I'm guessing I'm kind of tooling along somewhere in the 170 to 175 range. And the gauges look good. Again, I'm just kind of focused on the road and making sure that I'm staying on the road. Again, mostly straights, but when there's a turn, if it's a right-hand turn, you need to sit up in the left lane and make sure lift off, put some weight over the front tire so you can steer through the turn. Anyway, so there's the section called the Narrows, which is a canyon that's probably 20 miles from the finish line. And in the driver's meeting, they make a big deal about the Narrows. They're like, okay, when you get to the Narrows, you need to slow way down because you're winding through this canyon. And so I looked at the course notes. I kind of knew I had, they had a, a marker I forget it was a sign or something where you like you knew when you saw that you knew you're coming up on the narrow so i'm like okay i know where that is i'm not going to be caught going in there too fast and so as i'm passing all these cars i'm coming up on a, an original shelby gt350 this is probably a 66 the guy the guy that owned it uh, from california tuned it up had a bunch of power he's hauling butt and i'm but i'm 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 pulling on him and i'm i'm fixing to catch him and pass him and so he's not, he's giving me enough room to get by, but he's not giving me like a ton of room to get by. And again, this is just 
it's a two-lane road with a little, tiny bit of a shoulder. And so as I'm going by him, I'm seeing a kind of a sign ahead and the road kind of starts to turning. And again, I'm in the left lane and the road is going to start turning to the left. And so as I'm going around, I think the guy's name was DiLiberto, as I'm going around him, the road kind of starts turning. And I'm like, oh crap. And so now I've got two tires off in the gravel. I don't know how fast I'm going, but it's probably, when I went by him, it was probably 170. By now I've scrubbed a little bit of speed, but I got two tires kicking up rocks. I'm like, oh crap. And so you've got this decreasing radius off camber left-hand turn. Well, I was in the narrows, but the sign that tells you in the narrows didn't come up for like another mile or so. And so that was probably the scary moment of the whole race was going around trying to get around that car and thinking that I had enough real estate to do it when I really didn't. So I can tell you that that was a pucker moment, having two tires kicking up gravel at 150 plus mile an hour. But uh, made it through the narrows, ran across the finish line. <laughs> Tech guy comes up after the run and says, hey, that's a real nice run but you need to get a roll cage in this car and a few other safety items before you come back. I'm like, well, well how'd I do? He handed me my, my, my time slip and I, my average speed for the 90 miles was 164 miles an hour, which I was just thrilled about because I don't know, uh, I think they said on radar the car did 177 through the radar traps, which is kind of a downhill slope at the end uh, of the race. And then at the dinner, the awards dinner later that night, I got fourth place overall. And so I am just like, I am pumped, I'm hooked. I can't wait to come back and do the race in September. And so anyway, fast forward, I go to Pikes Peak, drive up to Pikes Peak. There's race rigs, there's crews, and I'm this guy in the pits with all my stuff in the back and floor jack. And, and these racers just thought it was hilarious. They're just like, who's this guy from Texas that would come up, just drive his car here and, and come race? And they would help me bleed my brakes. And, and so that was kind of, going to Pikes Peak was kind of a real eye opener of like, wow there's these big race teams and sponsors and i'm like i don't know how to do any of that stuff i just thought i could show up like c bantoon and just run my car which i did and again it was all dirt uh, i finished the race uh, i had delusions of winning my class or rookie of the year none of that stuff happened but i finished the race i didn't crash had a good time and i can say i was the only guy that drove it drove his car race car to pikes peak and drove home and uh, so that was pretty cool. And then fast forward, so that was around July. And then in September, with that was the Silver State Classic, which now I'm like, I'm hooked. I'm, I'm getting, I had the roll cage in it from Pikes Peak. Then I had to put a parachute on the back, made a few other modifications to the car to try to get some horsepower. It's getting a little sunny. I'm gonna put my sunglasses on. Um, I get to the Silver State. I'm now qualified to enter the Unlimited class. And so, there are a few other cars in the class. I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm here to win this thing. And so, ran the race. Uh, interesting thing, uh, the, the, the most interesting, harrowing moment of, of, of that race was I'm cruising along, and every now and then you see a buzzard on the highway eating roadkill. You don't want to hit roadkill, but you for sure don't want to hit one of these buzzards. They're probably two feet tall, probably weigh 20 pounds like a turkey, and you sure don't want them coming through the windscreen. So I see these buzzards off in the distance, and I see two of them take off, and I'm like, oh crap, there's still one there. He takes one more bite, he starts to take off, and I hit him, I mean, I, he, he goes through the headlamp, destroys the headlamp, and we found out after the race that just bird guts all through the engine compartment, but if that bird had, had been six inches higher, he would have come through the windshield, and I wouldn't be talking to you right now. So, um, survived that moment, but, uh, Average speed for that race was a little faster. I averaged 167, and I thought that I won the race, but there was another guy, he's a, he's a really talented engine builder in California, a guy named Richard Holder, had a Mustang that he supercharged and built, and he, he beat me by, I don't know, it, was, it wasn't a full mile an hour, it was, it was a fraction of a mile an hour, but he beat me fair and square, so I got second place overall in the race, but I did get first place for the unlimited class, which was pretty cool. So. Um, after doing all that, I learned the first rule of racing, and that is if you want to make a small fortune in racing, you start with a larger fortune. And so as I'm doing these races and modifying my car and planning the races and going to the races and having fun, uh, I'm not doing my construction business as much. 
uh, and I'm spending all my money on my car and, and race stuff. And so as I'm watching my bank account going southward, uh, I was getting ready to get married and I told my fiance, I said, I said, honey, I think I'd like to see if I could maybe make a business out of this. There's a few other guys like Carol Shelby and Alois Roof that had modified Shelby obviously with the Fords, Roof with the Porsches, Callaway with the Corvettes. I thought these guys somehow were able, it looks like they made kind of an interesting livelihood out of modifying cars for other people and I think I'd like to try to do that uh, for other people that have the Mitsubishi or the Dodge Stealth and uh, as a way that I could continue my racing program. So in 1991, Hennessy Performance, Hennessy Motorsports at the time, we changed it to performance back in the early 2000s, uh, was born. Uh, again, it was just probably not too different than other uh, famous racers that ended up becoming, you know, building cars, whether it's Ferrari or whoever. The, uh, the, the cars that we built today are a direct result of uh, my desire and passion to race and uh, anyway there's a lot of other questions that came in we'll answer those in a future vlog I've got to pull in a Whataburger here to get a quick little something to eat before I head to the office um, thanks for tuning in if again if you have questions regarding me the company our cars look forward to sharing those with you in next week's vlog thanks for tuning in